All right, Holly friends. I have the honor of introducing my friend, Richard Geether. Um, Richard and I and Ann here sitting in the middle there, uh, we all go to First Pres along with Marilyn. Any more Presbyterians here today? Um, Richard Geether is the Director of Campus Planning and Space Management and Facilities Management at Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama. Well, you must have double doors to fit all that. <laughs> that is a long name of your office. Um, in his seven years with the university, he has worked on numerous planning and capital project development, including the third update of the comprehensive master plan, development of a campus landscape and housing plans, and the refinement of a space planning model for determining university space needs. Prior to joining Auburn University, Richard was a city planner with the City of New York Department of City Planning, Bronx office where he worked on neighborhood rezoning projects. Before becoming a campus city planner, he was an investment management professional for 12 years. Richard received his master's degree in city and regional planning from Ohio State and has a bachelor's degree from Lafayette College um, in Eastern Pennsylvania. He's originally from New Jersey, but has resided in Auburn since 2013. In his presentation, Richard will cover the history of planning on the Auburn main campus, the impact of the campus master plan and other guiding documents on campus development. And also, uh, we'll discuss current and future campus development efforts. Please welcome Richard Geith. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, uh, thank you for attending. Um, thank you for the nice introduction there, Bill. I, I appreciate it. Uh, typically, uh, on a presentation, if I have a, this is a nice, nice small crowd, I like to say. Uh, if we have a larger crowd, I usually say, if we can, I can answer any questions that you have at the end. Uh, if any time during the, the presentation, if you have any questions about what, what I'm going over, uh, feel free to raise your hand and, uh, and I'll answer you uh, at that time. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few, uh, uh, a few items. Uh, uh, one, Bill, thank you, gave me a nice introduction, so I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about, <laughs> about myself there, but I'll talk a little bit about our office and, uh, and, and what we do and so, what some of our responsibilities are. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about campus planning history uh, at Auburn, uh, Auburn U University today, uh, what some of the demographics and what are uh, the state of, of some of our facilities are. And then I'll, I'll get into kind of the, uh, the, the meat of the presentation, which is our, our current uh, objectives and projects, and also what some of our, our future goals are also. Uh, a little bit about me, but Bill covered, uh, covered everything in his introduction. Uh, about our office, so uh, my office is, um, uh, I'm the Director of Campus Planning and Space Management at, at Auburn. Uh, we are part of the Office of the University Architect, which is a part of Facilities Management. So um, we, uh, in a, kind of the hierarchy of who we report to, uh, coming down from the President, uh, we report to the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, who's in charge of anything non-academic at the university. Um, Dan King oversees facilities, and, and my direct boss is Simon Yendel, who's the university architect. And he oversees the planning and design uh, of, of all facilities. Uh, he, is, he is a registered architect. Um, my specific role in campus planning is to look to the future and to, to look to see how uh, our facilities can meet the future needs uh, of the university. A second role of mine is the director of, uh, uh, of space management, where we keep an, an inventory of all university space. We know who it gets allocated to. We know how it gets used. And we, we, uh, we monitor it uh, every, every year and, and report on it also. Um, I have, uh, on my staff, I have two campus planners, one space manager, a space planner, and a CAD operator. Um, and I have, a, I have a terrific staff. They're, they're really wonderful people to work with. Um, 
Some of the, uh, some of the tasks that, that we uh, undertake at campus planning, uh, as I mentioned, we, we do planning for the near and long term uh, for the campus. Most of this is reflected in the campus master plan. It's something we typically update uh, um, every, every five years or so. The last time we updated it was in 2013, so we're a little bit past the deadline here. We anticipate doing an update in, in the next year or so. Uh, it's been an effective master plan, and as I'll talk about near the end of the presentation, it's had a strong impact on a lot of the, uh, uh, the projects uh, uh, we've done. Um, a key thing about our work is we have to align our work with, uh, with the goals of the university, and that includes with the university strategic plan, uh, with any academic and any financial goals of the university. So nothing gets done unless everything is in line. And that's, that's a, another key role of our office to make sure that, um, that those things are, are aligned. Uh, we maintain university guidelines and, and policies as they specifically rate, uh, relate to campus development. Um, and two of the key things that we do when we, when we do our, our, um, our guidelines is one, always whatever we do has to support the mission and the vision of overall the university. And the other is we, uh, our goal is to sustain the image and character uh, of the university and that physically I think people generally understand what, what Auburn is and it's, it's our, our job to communicate that and to make sure our projects that we, that we do and any future development ad adheres to that. Um, our planning areas cover a lot of different, uh, different parts. So these include buildings, landscape, infrastructure, parking, transportation, land use, space use, property, real estate, that entire, that entire list there. Um, it's not that we're out there, we're not digging holes, we're not, you know, laying bricks, we're not, uh, we're, we're not building things, but we are making sure that any projects that involve those adhere to our master plan and, and, and our, our long-term goals. Uh, as a planner, um, I believe that physical planning, it's inseparable from the university's strategic, academic, and financial planning missions. Without good planning, you don't get good projects, you don't get good results, and you don't get, you don't get a good university. Um, planning, the thing that interests me, interests me most is that it's comprehensive. We, um, when we look at projects, we look at them holistically. We see not just how much they cost and how big they are, but who they impact, how they impact the people at the university, and how they Im improve the university. Uh, we're a public university, and uh, our office takes pride in our role uh, that we are stewards of the public assets. Uh, and this includes our buildings, our lands, and the funds spent by, uh, uh, by the university. That's a key role there, uh, that we make sure we're, we are making wise decisions and, and spending uh, our money well and, doing, and spending it on the right things. And as I mentioned, uh, a planner's role is to think holistically uh, about things. Uh, think about who it can impact um, in the future, in the present, how it impacts our environment, how it impacts our land, uh, and to always behave in an ethical manner. A biggest, one of our biggest roles is to speak up and if, uh, if something doesn't seem, uh, seem right, um, and to, to say something about it. I don't guarantee that people always listen, but it's still our role to, uh, to say something. I like to begin uh, my talks with just a little bit about campus planning history at Auburn, uh, and, and to see some of the planning efforts that have taken place uh, over, the, uh, uh, over the last 150 years uh, or so. Uh, master planning has been done to a certain extent um, over the university's history. It generally involves a map. Sometimes that map is of, of, of current uses. Sometimes it's of, of uses uh, projected to happen in, in the future. Uh, one of the earliest plans and maps in the university is this one from, uh, from 1892 when the university was still known as the Agricultural uh, and Mechanical College uh, of Alabama. Uh, if you see, the university itself is actually right here. There are only about four or five uh, buildings in, in 1892. The student enrollment at that time was 243 students. Um, 
though when you look at this map, there's still some features here that are, are still around today. This main building here, that's Sanford Hall. It had just been completed in, in 1889, uh, and so it was on this map. Langdon Hall is next to it, uh, and so is Hargis Hall. The rest of the buildings have either uh, have been uh, have been removed, but nothing south of Thatch Avenue, nothing west of South College Street uh, was developed. This was stressing the agriculture and the agricultural mechanical college. All of these lands down here that have been developed down the road uh, were were used primarily for for, for agricultural purposes. Um, this is one of our maps that we like to show. Uh, the outline here is of the current university boundary. Uh, we have actually added a little bit of uh, more land uh, down here uh, off of Longleaf uh, to be used by the College of Vet Med and, and the College of Agriculture for future pasture lands. But if you look at the current outline of the university and you see before 1900, this is all there was uh, in development. Over time, that development uh, grew. and. Uh, some of uh, and this development started to spread a little bit further south and a little bit further west. You can see Comer Hall right here uh, and some additional buildings. Uh, this is probably Mary Martin Hall right here and that's, that's Cater Hall uh, there. So as development took place, uh, it grew gradually uh, over time uh, until you got to about 1929. Um, this is a, uh, a plan for the university that was drawn up by the, uh, the landscape architecture firm, the Olmsted brothers. You may know who Frederick Law Olmsted is. He was one of the uh, two architects for Central Park in New York, also Piedmont Park in Atlanta, and numerous other parks throughout the country. This is, wasn't something that the university um, um, uh, requested from them. They actually went from college town to college town and drew up some master plans for several university. But we were we benefited from them coming through town. One of the great things about this plan, uh, you can see this is the um, uh, this is Sanford Park and Sanford Hall and Langdon here. There's a building here that that was never built, but you can see the winding path or the curving path, excuse me, that begins at Tumor's Corner and goes through the university here. Uh, when we redid Tumor, uh, Samford Park uh, a, a few years ago, we used this path as an inspiration. Uh, and so we basically took this and, and replicated it because uh, we wanted to stress kind of the, the curving, meandering nature through, through the park and kind of to, to stress the, the rural and, and agricultural heritage of, of, of the university there. Uh, by 1929, enrollment had grown, and then over the next 20 or, or so years prior to, uh, uh, or in the 30s prior to World War II, there was, there was continued growth uh, in the university. One of the things you can see that's most notable is that the stadium keeps getting bigger. So that by 1959, you had a, you had a horseshoe stadium, uh, no end zone here, no upper deck, but it's the same uh, shape uh, that, of the stadium that we see today. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite images, I know it's one of Bill's favorite images too here, uh, this is an aerial photograph of, uh, of Auburn, then known as Alabama Polytechnic Institute uh, from 1947. Uh, steady growth in enrollment here up to just over 6,000 uh, 6, students. Um, and you can see a lot of the buildings that are still around and are some of the iconic Auburn buildings today. Sanford Hall right here, Mary Martin Hall here. By this time, the quad had been developed, and there's a few other smaller buildings uh, that, um, this is Titchener Hall here, Ross Hall here. Uh, these buildings had been developed by that time. A lot of the, what we call the iconic Auburn buildings were built between 1920 and 1940. Uh, oh, Bill, go ahead. Sure. Um, and so this, uh, this reflects uh, a number of those buildings. Uh, we use those buildings as inspiration uh, when we, when we uh, look to develop new facilities. They're a part of the reason why the red brick is, is such an important part of the, the campus development infrastructure. It's because of the buildings that were built at this time. Bill, you said at, at this time here? Uh, 
That's a good question. It was part of the Morrill Act. I believe it was 1872 uh, was the year. There were two parts to the Morrill Act. I think, I believe, and I, I would need to confirm this, that Auburn was one of the original Morrill Act uh, uh, universities. What the original land grant area was, I'm not sure. There were two types of universities for the land, uh, for the Morrill Act. One was uh, new land, which I believe the federal government purchased and, or, uh, and gave uh, in conjunction with the states, and the states went on and operated the university. That was new land. There was also a different set of universities, which were existing universities. So what happened with Auburn, it was original, it was at this point the uh, Agricultural Mechanical College. It uh, chose to sign up to the Morrill Act program. All the benefits that went with it, again, I'm not uh, a big historian on it, but that was, those were the two types of, of, uh, of Morrill Act uh, and, and land-grant universities. So uh, it would be interesting to see. I just don't have the data on it. A lot of our real estate data is really old and hasn't been digitized yet or transferred into uh, some other electronic format uh, where we can do analysis on it. So our real estate office, has these um, has papers in files uh, that represent some of the initial exchanges of land. I know there's one uh, piece of paper that's signed by Andrew Jackson, uh, I believe. Uh, it was probably, I don't know um, exactly why Andrew Jackson was involved in that. It was after he was president, but um, this is a big step that we need to take at Auburn to kind of get all this digitized. We can then do uh, analysis to see how the university actually grew land, uh, land wise over the years. Um, yes? The upper left hand corner here. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> later on, that was the, the uh, uh, Caroline drawn village but I let me just see a later map if that it could be an error on the map uh, I'm, no this is actually right because it was not there in the 1940s the the initial uh, drawn village was built in the late 50s so that is the uh, the uh, the, um, the graduate or family housing uh, for the university uh, at that time the yeah the married house. yep Oh, okay, great. Yep, I think during my first year or first six months at Auburn, I was actually one of the last people to actually reside there um, before uh, it was uh, most of it was repurposed. So, um, we call it the marriage student housing. Is what we call it. Marriage student housing. But he was single, but that's where they put him. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so between 1947 and uh, 1960, uh, additional growth by the university. This is one of the first efforts by the university itself to draw a, a future plan. This was done by, um, uh, by the University Buildings and Grounds Group, uh, which is now Facilities Management. Um, and it was done as an internal map. Again, you can see the interesting thing is seeing some of these ideas of just buildings that just never got built over the years. But it shows a need here and here of future dormitories, um, knowing that at some point in, in the next uh, 10 years, uh, more and more baby boomers would be coming to school. You would have this big uh, increase in enrollment, especially starting in the, uh, in the mid-60s and going all the way to the... Uh, uh, to the 80s. Around this time, student enrollment was around 8,829 uh, and continued uh, growth by the university. This is uh, a map of the University of the, of the 60s. Uh, you can see two of the big buildings here, drawn library, uh, although this later addition was not made until the 1980s. Uh, Beard Eves, uh, or originally Memorial Coliseum, and then later Beard Eves Memorial Coliseum. Uh, through, uh, through 1969, uh, additional development through the 70s, and beginning in the, in the late 70s was when some of the master planning work, uh, the more formal master planning work uh, began. One of the first times the university reached out to a firm to actually look uh, to develop a master plan was in 1978. 
Uh, this is a very interesting first effort uh, by the university and very reflective of, of the times. If you look at a close-up of the university, you'll notice it's essentially just mostly buildings and parking. You can see uh, to, the, um, to the west of, of the stadium, also to the northwest of, of, of how much parking. A lot of this was parking already. Uh, this is just bringing it, adding pavement and bringing a more organized uh, uh, arrangement for, for the parking there. Uh, in our master planning efforts today, this isn't something we would, we would consider. We realize that the need for green space surrounding our buildings. We're trying to do a more pedestrian-oriented uh, campus here. So as a first effort, it's interesting, but it's, uh, it's not what we would do today. A second effort came in 1988. Uh, this was by the firm Johnson Johnson and Roy. If you look at the close-up of the interior, uh, you'll look in the middle of campus. The quad uh, residence halls are no longer there. This this plan proposed tearing them down and replacing them and putting, I guess, what you'll call kind of a more traditional campus uh, 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 green space here. But it goes away from the quad con uh, concept, which is something that's very strongly. Uh, makes, you know, is, makes up Auburn. Uh, we're glad that we, this plan never gave, you know, came to fruition. Uh, the, um, I, I spoke to recently to one of the planners who worked on this, and when he came back to campus, he saw how, how, how beautiful the, 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 the quads were and how, how nice a space they create, and he, he was very glad that their plan never, uh, never was, was uh, put into effect there. Uh, during the 80s, and uh, one thing to note here is that the student enrollment uh, by 1978, compared to just about um, uh, about 18 years before, that had is, in essence doubled. From 1960 to uh, to 1978 was a big jump uh, in enrollment over that time, and and then by 1988 again a little bit more growth to uh, to 20,000, and that's where university enrollment stayed for uh, for a while. Uh, additional growth in the 80s and 90s. And then we came to the late 90s and early 2000s. And this is when the university decided to formally adopt a, a master plan. So in 2002 was the first master plan that was uh, adopted by the University Board of Trustees. Every other effort had been one that, that was never officially adopted by the university. Uh, this one was. Uh, this was an important uh, plan because it, it brought forth some major changes to the university. This plan recommended closing down Thatch Avenue and making a pedestrian uh, concourse uh, out of it. This plan also recommended uh, moving uh, some development further west to develop new student housing, which later became the, uh, uh, the village housing. It was one of the first plans to recognize that, look, we have sections that are heavily tied to specific colleges uh, and schools. One of the biggest ones is COSAM here, uh, right in the center of campus, and COSAM is one of the university's most important colleges because uh, students from uh, all colleges in their early years take classes, at your introductory classes in, in, in COSAM, especially your chemistry, biology, engineering is heavily connected to COSAM. Uh, it also looked at, at development and tried to uh, form that pedestrian connectivity that we're still trying to improve today. Because of this plan, we developed a transit system, which is, uh, we have a very strong transit system on campus uh, today. It was one of the recommendations uh, of this plan. And it also reintroduced uh, Parkerson Mill Creek as a campus asset. Years before, Parkerson Mill Creek was covered up, put in a culvert. Uh, and so it still runs through campus. Much of it is underground. But there are areas uh, on, on campus where we're trying to daylight Parkerson Mill Creek and trying to bring a little bit more, uh, remember the natural areas that, that were, are important to, uh, uh, to the university. Um, again, some of the, um, the, uh, the images that came from that plan and some of the buildings that came from it, the poultry science building, the uh, 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 information technology building, Forestry, forestry, all in the south area of campus in the medical clinic were all recommendations by this, by this plan. Um, uh, the West Quad area wound up developing into the quad, a little bit different design, uh, but and Thatch Avenue pedestrianization. 
I really like this image because, but we're not, we're still not quite there yet. Um, Thatch Avenue still needs more trees and more shades for it to be a really, really good pedestrian area. We hope to get there uh, over time. Uh, in 07, we had the first master plan update, um, and th this one really focused on the landform of the university. Additional uh, emphasis on Parkerson Mill Creek, and focused on maintaining our trees uh, and uh, some of our, uh, our natural habitat areas. It, it enhanced the, uh, the discussion on circulation, be it vehicular, uh, bicycles, or, or transit, and it introduced some new districts and some land, landscape structures. Uh, and the third master plan update, yep. Oh, you got, okay. Absolutely. So from the southern end of the campus, um, it, it starts here pretty close to the intersection of, of uh, Shug Jordan and, uh, and South College. Uh, it goes through ag areas here, crosses under um, uh, Shug Jordan, and next to the beef teaching unit here, goes through this area that was also, until recently, had been beef air, uh, teaching areas, and our forested area to, uh, to the east goes north through campus, pretty right next to Big EO and the, uh, the recreation fields, uh, continues going north uh, till old, in between Old Hutzel Track and the athletics complex. Just before it, it, it hits the, uh, the Coliseum area, it, 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 it bends right, crosses over Donahue Drive just south of, the, uh, uh, of Plainsman Park, and then cuts through campus. By this point, uh, it's, it's all underground. It was once all daylighted, uh, but it is now all underground. It goes parallel to, uh, to Allison and Parker, uh, and then cuts, uh, continues underground, and actually goes to this area where it's culverted uh, next to the library. Originally, I believe this was a lake. It was originally called, it was a pond more, it was either a tiger pond or ti tiger lake. Um, but that has, years ago, uh, that was all put, put underground. Uh, and, and then it, it continues, I believe, across uh, South College Street. But by, at this point, uh, there's very little left, uh, left of the stream. Uh, That's not what they considered the river under the stadium? There is a tributary of it. Uh, the main tributary is, runs adjacent to it, but around, right around, uh, Right up over here, it splits off, and yes, there's a tributary that cuts under the Beard Eves, uh parking lot and then goes right under the stadium and, and further north there. So, yep. It does that in a few areas. The area, the, the creek I pointed out was the main creek. There are also tributaries that run up uh, near the old uh, Caroline Drawn Village and, and near the fraternity area here. It, it runs along... Um, I believe it cuts across uh, in back of the old CDV extension and cuts across wire, uh, wire road there. So. And then the last uh, most recent update to the master plan was the one I, uh, I had arrived and I helped work on in, in 2012. Uh, this one uh, was heavily influenced by capital project needs. Uh, and so we took a turn away from kind of the natural development of, of the campus. And at this point, a lot of our buildings and our development that had taken place in the 20s, 30s, and especially in the 50s and 60s was starting to get pretty old. Uh, some of our most used buildings, Haley Center is one that comes to mind, had gotten a little bit long in the tooth. And we started looking at uh, different ways we can, we can replace those buildings and what our academic uh, building needs were. Uh, we're going forward. Oops. Um, this was this master plan was a lot about process, but we're, we also went to all the different colleges and schools and to help identify some of their needs there. Uh, and we developed a long-term facility development plan for for replacement and building some new facilities. I'm going to touch a little bit on some of those facilities a little bit later in the presentation. But this uh, this plan was was uh, highly influential on that. And then our historic expansion continued until uh, you can even see the difference between uh, around 2000 and 05 uh, to now. Just there's been a lot of development going on uh, at the university. 
Auburn University today, just some numbers uh, I wanted to share with you. Uh, our total enrollment now is about 30,000. Uh, it's between 30 and 31,000. Uh, much of that is undergraduate. We now have about 25,000 undergraduate students. Where five years ago we had 25,000 total student, students. So it was a big jump in the last, last five years. Uh, a gentleman had asked me the question, uh, going forward, um, what, uh, what type of growth can we expect? Um, we don't have a clear grasp on that, but the president has stated that he's not so much interested in growing the undergraduate population, but more interested in growing this, this graduate uh, uh, enrollment here. Uh, in addition to our 30,000 students, we have 7,000 uh, employees on campus. That's a total headcount. Now this number excludes student employees, of which there is a large amount, the 5820, but I didn't want to double count them from this number. So about 30,000 students uh, and about 7,000 uh, employees. 1,300 faculty and uh, a good number of uh, administrators and, and part-time time workers on, on campus. This was that uh, increase I had mentioned in the last five years. If you look at our student enrollment from uh, for the last 20 years or so, you see a steady rise until about 2014 when we had this little, uh, this, this sharper increase in enrollment. Uh, when we did our master plan in 2013, the guidance we got from administration was that the university was not growing <laughs> and we would stay at 25,000 students. We're now at over 30, and this has caused us a little bit of agita <laughs> over the, uh, the last five years because we're, we're catching up, and uh, we have a lot more building to do, I think, just to maintain a campus uh, that can support uh, 30,000 students in addition to uh, redo, or redoing some of our, our, our older buildings. Um, our, our, the university's land has grown uh, over the years also. Currently, the, the main campus has about 2,100 acres. That's contiguous acres uh, on, on the main campus here. If it's a property that's immediately adjacent to the university, like the, 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 um, uh, like the museum property, it's included in that here. In North Auburn, we have an additional 3,200 acres. The airport's about 400 acres. And throughout Lee County, we have an additional 770 acres. In other areas around the state, uh, yeah, we have uh, AU uh, in Montgomery has about 550 acres. We have the large research center uh, just off of I-85 that's about 3,900 acres. And throughout Alabama, we have uh, about 18,000 uh, acres total. These are largely our extension areas that are scattered, uh, scattered throughout the state. Uh, oops, what was also surprising to me was that we have about 730 acres outside of Alabama. <laughs> So uh, this is, uh, these are uh, properties, I think it's just two properties and most of it is in one, uh, uh, one area. It's about, I believe, um, six to 700 acres in Georgia and we have about 50 acres in Virginia. <laughs> so. I gotta be honest with you, I don't know. Uh, they were granted to the university. I don't, we haven't quite come up with a plan of what to do with them yet. Uh, so, and this was something, honestly, that just came to my attention recently. So it, it, we're getting to know our, our outlying areas a little bit better and uh, can, uh, developing some plans of what to do uh, with those. I know with our extension areas, uh, a lot of our areas around the state just aren't being used as they were in the past. We're kind of we're doing most of our research uh, in kind of more uh, uh, areas like E.B. Smith where there's a lot more acreage there. Uh, and so some of our areas scattered around the state we may look to, uh, to sell, it's possible, but so we'll see. 736 acres of the land? No, I think it, it's, it's mostly I think residential <laughs> and land, so. Uh, I don't, again, I, I have to learn a little bit more about them. This it was a little bit of a surprise to me. Uh, on the main campus, we have 356 buildings. Now, we count a building as something that has a roof, that has walls, has foundation, and has at least two types of uh, utilities going to it. 
We have numerous other what we call non-building structures. We have lots of pole barns. We have lots of, uh, of towers. We have lots of sheds. But buildings, and which primarily have people in them, we have about 356,000 and just under 12 million uh, square feet in, in, in building area. Our largest building on campus is still Jordan Hare Stadium, uh, but our two largest academic buildings are now uh, Drawn Library, which became the largest academic building when we did the uh, Mel Classroom uh, edition just a couple years ago. And Haley Center is still one of our most heavily used uh, buildings. It's our biggest classroom building on campus. Um, and it's filled with offices and, and faculty and staff. And uh, um, one of the challenges will be replacing Haley, uh, which uh, we're working on plans to do that. I'll talk a little bit about what our plans are later. But we can't do anything with Haley until we get people out of Haley. And that's the biggest, biggest challenge right now. Current objectives. Just to, to talk a little bit about, and I'll check the time here. Uh, about some of our guiding documents uh, that we use when we, uh, when we do our planning work and we, when we make decisions on campus. Uh, we don't just do thing, make up things out of the blue and, and try to make random decisions about things. We, we utilize these guiding documents for, uh, to help in our decision making. Uh, number one is the university strategic plan, which gets updated every five years. We are in the middle of an update right now. This strategic plan determines the overall direction of the university for the next five years. So it's primarily academic, uh, academically driven. It's also driven by research. Uh, we see facilities uh, as something to support uh, uh, the strategic plan. The, we also have a, do, oops, we have a document called the Image and Character of Auburn University, which we first did in 2001. Uh, this was a plan that helped us create a master plan. But we wanted to answer the question first, what is Auburn? What, what makes Auburn, uh, you know, what it is? It's, it's, it's a lot of different things. It's, it's the buildings, it's, it's the brick in the buildings, it's how those buildings are designed. Uh, but the most important thing, and this an architecture professor shared with me, is that Auburn is completely about the spaces in between. It's not the buildings themselves. It's the way you get back and forth uh, to buildings. It's the trees, it's the shade, it's the pathways. Uh, it's the feeling you get when you walk through Auburn's campus. That's what we tried to capture in the image and character of, of Auburn University. Uh, we're doing an update now because um, a lot of that was master planning driven f specifically for developing a new master plan at that time. So w we're going to look to uh, develop an update to that that more clearly kind of defines what the imaging character of Auburn is and so we can use it as a planning and development tool uh, going forward. Uh, yep. Yep. It's um, one thing that's unique about Auburn's campus is that a lot of our buildings have those same materials. Almost every building on Auburn's campus has that red brick that ties everything together. If you compare Auburn to other, uh, other, uh, other campuses around the country, our buildings aren't necessarily the most exciting. Uh, they're not necessarily the most uh, forward-looking, but we do maintain that tradition of what uh, we would like our, our buildings to, to look like. It's a I think a number of them, them do. Um, it, it, not necessarily the same type of brick, um, but I, I think a lot of universities in general try to maintain that, that type of, of, uh, of style of development, tr maintain some consistency across, uh, across their different uh, buildings and, and their, their development. There are also other, other universities that have decided to go in a different way. And this is what Bill had mentioned here. If you go up to, for example, MIT in Boston, Every building looks different. Every building was hired with a star architect and uh, who 
was really interested in doing something completely unique on the campus. And when you look at that building, it's a, probably a pretty neat building to look at. But when you look at it as being part of the fabric of campus, that's completely missing. That's what we want to maintain here at Auburn, Auburn that campus development fabric. And so that's, that's what we utilize this, uh, this document for. Uh, the third one there is the campus master plan, uh, which I th think I've spoken enough about, but that's, what, that's our primary guiding document that tells us uh, what we need on campus, where it should go, uh, and uh, who the users would be, et cetera. In 2015, as a supplement to the campus master plan, we did our first landscape master plan. This is, a, this is an interesting document uh, that goes in depth at looking at the different features of the Auburn University campus landscape. And it looks uh, at everything, including it has a list of trees we recommend planting. Uh, just in general, we recommend planting native trees uh, to, uh, to Alabama. A lot of that has not been done over the years, so we have a lot of trees from, uh, that were kind of trendy at the time. And, uh, uh, but it also looks at what our pathways should look, look like, what, what types of sidewalks we should have, uh, how they should be lined, et cetera. Yes, sir. Uh, we do. Our GIS isn't super advanced right now, and it's something we want to move forward with, you know, because it can help us. We have used it in the past uh, when, for doing some tree studies. We used it for determining what some of our important trees and some of our heritage trees to keep are. That's reflected in the campus landscape master plan. We've mostly used it for land use planning uh, to section areas and determine what the different land uses on campus and when we do future development try to keep these different types of uses together um, and, and then there's various other policies procedures and guidelines uh, including our signage you probably uh, have seen our building signage on campus it's consistent uh, across campus we try to maintain the same font type the same color of our building signs and other signage uh, to be consistent uh, across campus. Uh, we're work also working on a tree preservation policy uh, to make it challenging so that we can't just go and cut down trees and put something. If we do, one, we try to build around the trees. Number two, if we do cut down trees, because we absolutely have to, um, we have to make sure we replace those trees uh, and do something that's beneficial uh, to the campus from a landscape perspective. Uh, also. Also it requires, and there's a project coming up, that we are going to need to cut down a number of, uh, of trees, but the wood from those trees is going to be used in the building itself, and those trees are going to be replaced to provide more shade in other areas of campus. So, um, Looking back at the master plan and looking at some of the, the, uh, the objectives laid out in the 2013 plan, this is just a quick uh, assessment over the last five or six years to see what we did well and to see what we, we didn't do that well. Um, construct new campus facilities, and these are all objectives that were laid out in the master plan. Uh, construct new cl uh, classroom facilities. We did that with the, with the Mel classroom building. We added uh, a good amount, about 70,000 square feet of building and a, a good number of uh, mostly classrooms in that building. Uh, one of the goals, and a big goal, was to replace o older academic uh, facilities not worthy of, of uh, reinvestment. We, we have not done well at that one. At the top of that list are some of our buildings, Haley Center, Spital Hall. Uh, these, are, these are still objectives, but we didn't do a very good job with that. Uh, we've renovated uh, one significantly ar uh, architecturally significant facility. I don't know if anybody has had a chance to go into the old textile uh, building. It is now the Gavin Engineering Laboratory. If you get a chance, take a look inside where we were, did, a, I think, a good job of, of preserving uh, a lot of the wood and infrastructure in there, but created a modern laboratory uh, for, uh, for engineering in the future. Uh, we developed a new health science sector. Uh, this is, we were able to move the, the College of Nursing uh, out of the core of campus, and we, we uh, built a new building for them on the, on the intersection of Donahue and, and, and Lem Morrison. Uh, there's also a new pharmaceutical research building there. Over time, we're going to add some more, uh, some more buildings there. Uh, so we think we've taken some good steps in there. 
uh, invest in a facility that supports the art. This was specifically written to develop a new performing arts center, so we're, we're on the way uh, uh, to doing that there. Invest in college and departmental research facilities. We have not made uh, advance that uh, much in the last five years. The president has made it one of the primary objectives to enhance our research facilities, so we're looking at some future projects to do that now. Uh, and then the, the last is just is mostly procedural type things, um, which we th feel we've made some good strides on. Um, one of the big ones is our post-construction stormwater planning. We now have a policy for the university that you may see when, when a construction site takes place, and there's been a number of construction sites on campus, is that uh, very often our contractors, uh, the folks we hire, they hadn't in the past paid attention to the harm it can have to the environmental system around it. Uh, there can be a lot of runoff, there can be a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of sediment going to different, uh, uh, different areas of the city. It gets into the creek and spreads out to different areas. Um, and the other thing is when we develop, we're adding a lot more permeable surface uh, to, uh, to the university. One of the key things is that making sure that that surface, we compensate for that. We do not add to the, uh, we do not tax our stormwater system. We add uh, retaining uh, uh, ponds, or be they underground or above ground, and other means for, for diverting stormwater uh, properly so we can make up for that additional previous uh, uh, sentiment. So this is the part I'm just going to talk about some current projects on campus. You probably have seen some of these uh, taking place and some big development going on. Uh, I'll, be, I'll talk a little bit about them, be, be happy to answer any questions we have on them. Uh, one of the first uh, that I'm going to talk about, this is, and these are all projects that are completing this year and should be done by, by the end of the year. I'm not going to go back and I could go on and talk about some of our recent projects like nursing, like the Mel Classroom Building, and, so, and, and Gavin, and some of the other ones. But I'm going to focus on the ones that you're going to see construction finish up this year or where construction has just finished up. Uh, the Mel Corridor improvements. So as, um, as part of the Mel Classroom Building and the new classroom addition to the library, one of the things we decided was that we're going to add to the pedestrianization of campus. And we had already cut off parts of thatch and made them pedestrian only. We've now taken that step to make the front of the library and the Mel Classroom Building a pedestrian only area. So where this was Mel Street, it's now a, uh, a pedestrian walkway and also a, a, a bike path. You can see here, uh, there's a formal bike path here. We've added some bioswales in the, in the middle to help with some, um, uh, some drainage uh, from storm and we'll have some kind of natural growth in there. We've planted some trees along, uh, uh, along the, uh, uh, the pathway here. And the great thing about this Picture, this picture was taken two days after the project opened. So already, after putting out furniture on there, students and faculty are already sitting down and, and using the area. And this, was, this is in the winter. Obviously, new trees, uh, they're just growing in now. Over time, we expect these to be shade trees and to be used, used year-round. So this is one of the projects we're, we're really proud of. This is the type of thing we want to do more of on campus, make it comfortable to walk around on campus, to be outside year-round. Uh, the Leach Science Center. This is, a, uh, this is a project that's nearing completion. This is an addition to the Leach Building that's on the intersection of Duncan Drive and, and Samford uh, Avenue. Uh, as I said, this is a, about a 60,000 square foot addition. This is, uh, is built to house the physics department. The physics department was located in Parker Hall, which is right in the middle of, of campus. Parker Hall is next to Allison Laboratories. Uh, the plan for that area there is to eventually tear both those buildings down and we're going to replace them with a new uh, classroom laboratory building. These are going to be general purpose classrooms uh, to be controlled by the registrar for it to be used by any college and school, much like the classrooms in Haley Center. Building this building gives us a, a jump on things and expands our classroom capacity. One of the things it helps us do, it helps us justify tearing down Haley Center at some point. It's not technically to replace them. It helps justify that uh, down the road. So the first part of that project, 
uh, was to tear, uh, is to going to be to take down Allison Laboratories. We're currently emptying out the building at the completion of this semester. That uh, demolition on that building will begin next month. We're going to leave Parker Hall open, however, during, uh, during the construction of that building. In order to get folks out of both Parker and Allison, we needed to build a new, uh, a new physics building, and that's what the Leach Hall uh, addition uh, is here. It was about a $24 million building. Uh, it does provide uh, state-of-the-art uh, laboratories uh, for, for physics and consolidates physics in, in one place next to their, their building. Yes, it is. It's right, on, it's right on Sanford. Although you can't see it here, there's still space here between the building and Sanford uh, for, for some future uh, development, but that won't take place uh, right away. I just took this picture uh, image this morning. Sorry about the, the moving truck in there, but that's a sign that folks are, are moving in here. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Because it's it's so big, uh, you're talking about moving p uh, people into the um, uh, into Parker Hall or into here. No, in uh, Parker and the laboratory couldn't be Yeah, one one reason is uh, Haley Center is mostly an office building. Floors uh, six through ten, essentially. The Tower of Haley is mostly office. And it's, uh, it's got a lot of classroom space on that. Parker Hall does have a lot of classroom space. Uh, and the registrar is going to continue to schedule it uh, while we're doing this construction. But it would only take out, frankly, a fraction of Haley. Uh, and Haley's compo uh, composed of a lot of the College of Liberal Arts. It has a lot of the College of Education. It has uh, that classroom space. There's also some other tricky things about it. A lot of our telecommunications network is housed in the basement of Haley, so it's going to be costly to do that. So it's not just kind of one step that's needed to get folks out of Haley. It's multiple steps. We, we could do something like that, uh, except that um, Parker Hall, yeah, and Parker Hall is also being backfilled with folks in Allison, too, which is coming down first. So. You just don't have have the room for it right now. But, yeah. Those old pine trees in that, the, that's down there by the amphitheater architecture building, beautiful. Uh, amphitheater is on this side uh, of, of Duncan and a little bit further uh, further north uh, towards the, the center of campus there. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's over here, uh, essentially. Right here is the, um, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, the, uh, uh, the, the art center, the... Uh, Yes, Telfair Pete Theater, sorry. Um, and right here, here's a little parking net uh, next to Pete Theater, and so the, um, uh, the uh, amphitheater is, is in here, so. Mm -hmm. Yep. Bill, how much time do I have? Till four. Till four, okay. Uh, yes. That's a good question. Typically, most of that is taken over by our surplus property group. Uh, and then uh, the equipment is often auctioned off, uh, generally in the summertime. So uh, I, I don't know if that's going to fall into this summer schedule, but surplus property is the group. And we have a, there's a surplus property web page which lists the, uh, it, it, they, uh, when the auction time comes, they list everything they're going to auction off. That's where I imagine a lot of that is going to go. So. Uh, the South College parking deck. Uh, this is a 600-space uh, a parking deck that is built uh, just south of the hotel. Uh, you may know of the project that's going in just to the north of the hotel. It was just approved by the Board of Trustees uh, uh, last, uh, it was in April. Uh, and that project is to develop a culinary science center uh, there. As we were doing, working on the plans for that center, uh, it was, we, we knew we were going to take up parking, uh, and we knew we needed some additional parking uh, on or near the site. 
We also, one of the biggest complaints of uh, faculty and staff, and it's, it's been a tough one to work on, is the, is the desire for additional parking near the campus core. Uh, because of all the development that's been going on, there's, there's less parking near uh, in, in that area. So uh, this was a pretty quick project, but we've, uh, we're almost nearing completion of, a, of what we're calling the South College Parking Deck. This is in the hotel the old hotel parking lot. So it's intended to bring an additional 200 to 250 spaces for what we call faculty or, or A and B parking. Uh, that's, that's pretty close to the core. It also replaces all of the hotel parking and parking for the new culinary, uh, culinary science center. It's a big parking deck. Um, it's, it's not bad looking for a parking deck, but it is a big deck. It's, uh, uh, and it is going to be about a, a five-level deck, I believe. So. What will be um, certain levels just for the Yes. So the way um, it's organized as of now, according to the director of parking, is that the first level is going to be valet parking for the hotel. Levels two and three are going to be the faculty and staff parking for the university. So if you buy a parking pass, and it's, it's right now what we'd call A and B parking, you can park there. The top two levels are going to be for the hotel. Um, they'll be accessed via a, um, uh, one of the uh, arms that, that go up and down. So you'll have to, I believe, to check in the hotel, get your swipe card first or call in from there. And then so it'll be restricted uh, who can go in and out for the hotel part. Um, no, this is not going to be visitor parking, and it is not going to be student parking, uh, but it is going to be for faculty and staff uh, parking. So. Uh, the next project is the uh, Brown Coppola Engineering Student Achievement Center. This is on the site uh, that you may have known as where the old the L buildings and the engineering shops were. Those were torn down a couple of years ago to uh, to build this new uh, new facility. This is uh, this is one of our most forward-looking engineering buildings. Uh, a number of universities are doing this type of thing. This is not strictly for classrooms. This is not for for faculty offices. This is what we call makerspace. This is a place for students to gather mostly engineering students, but it will be open to all students, to come and work together and, and develop ideas uh, for, uh, to apply the, you know, of what they've learned and to look to develop kind of new forward-looking ideas in all engineering and, and, and other disciplines. Um, it's, it, the space will be, um, uh, open to a, a large area that's actually going to be, it's built on a plinth, so it's introducing some new open space to the core of campus. Uh, and beneath that open space uh, is going to be uh, just unfinished space for future engineering laboratories. So we're really, really increasing our engineering capacity uh, for laboratories and for, uh, for students uh, going forward. It's... Um, this is nearing completion. It should be open. Uh, it will be open for the for the upcoming uh, fall semester. Uh, this is the Graduate Business Building. This is on the uh, the corner of Donahue and, and Magnolia. Uh, this is uh, this building built by um, uh, funds from the business school uh, is intended for graduate and MBA program uh, students. So. Uh, a place where they can hold classes. They, uh, a lot of their online classes will be featured here. The business school has grown quite a bit over the number of years, so uh, this additional space uh, uh, will serve, uh, serve them. There's going to be classrooms uh, in the building also, uh, some studio lecture space and some study pods and such for students. And we're also creating an, an open space here. This building is a little bit different uh, than some of our buildings because we do have a fairly large glass wall uh, on the buildings. It's something we typically don't do uh, in our buildings. Uh, it will open up to, a, uh, to an outdoor area, um, but we still try to maintain the, the traditional Auburn features of our building, our traditional red brick uh, with, with limestone highlights in the building. So it's pushing a little bit forward and a little bit different 
um, but it's, uh, we still think it's, 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 it fits in with the Auburn, uh, the Auburn imaging character. Yes? Uh, it is. It's actually, the building is up already, and it's so, it's, it's not right next to Louder. The space between Louder and, and the Graduate bus Business Building will be an outdoor uh, seating area, an outdoor plaza. It's on the, it's on the west side of Louder. Yes, there did, there used to be parking there. Uh, yep, it's right on the corner. Yep. Yep, exactly. Louder's right here, so you can see. Think of this, this is Magnolia here, and this is heading towards, uh, uh, towards Tumor's Corner, if you're going in, in this direction here. Uh, the Performing Arts Center, I, I'm sure you've seen uh, the Performing Arts Center going up right across the street from the museum here. Uh, it will be our 1,200 seat um, uh, art center that will be geared towards, it's really a regional art center. This is, the building was not built for, for student performances, although it will occasionally have student performances. This was intended to, to attract regional acts. Um, the building is a little bit different than uh, some of our traditional Auburn buildings, but if you look at the museum, that kind of set the standard for this area. It kind of fits in that con uh, context we do use brick on the building, but it's a little bit uh, different, uh, different type of and different color uh, of brick. This uh, image was taken this morning. We're getting closer to completion. The first performance will be uh, in in August. It's a large building, about 85,000 square feet, and it's uh, the budget for it was just under 70 uh, 70 million dollars. Um, the best thing about the building, in my mind, is that is the outdoor spaces it creates. It really takes an area that had prim primarily been used uh, for agricultural purposes in the past. It's creating a lot of walking trails, uh, a good connection to campus. We're going to add some uh, some additional surface parking to uh, to the north of it, um, which will serve commuter students. And so one of the goals is to increase our transit capacity to go back and forth from here to the uh, to the main campus. Um, you may have seen this when driving along Wire Road. Uh, this is the recreation field expansion uh, project. This is the rendering of what it will look like when it's complete. A uh, Wire Road is right here, and then the uh, Lem Morrison uh, begins here. These are the existing rec fields. So this is just to the south of them. These are the old uh, beef teaching pasture lands. So. Uh, we kind of exchanged some land with, uh, with beef teaching. They're now moving their pastures a little bit further to the west and south. Uh, the, we thought this was a good area because of its, of its connectivity to the existing uh, fields, but it adds uh, some new softball fields, a couple of, a few multi-purpose fields. Uh, this is a combination lacrosse rugby uh, field. And this is for intramural students. This is for your typical Auburn students. This is not for uh, for our, our, uh, our athletes, um, uh, intercollegiate athletes here. So uh, any student will be able to, uh, to, to use these fields. Uh, also a little bit of a clubhouse and some restrooms and, and, and some locker rooms there. This is the first expansion of rec fields since, uh, since 1979. Around that time, our, uh, our, our student population was 18,000 students. Uh, we're now over 30, so it was really about time that we added some additional uh, fields to, uh, um, uh, to campus. Uh, this building's under construction now. It's, there's not, uh, we haven't made a lot of progress on it. You can see some of the steel structure. This is going in next to Goodwin Hall. Goodwin Hall is our mu music building. It's going in between Goodwin Hall and uh, the Gorey Center, uh, which is our building science uh, uh, building. Uh, it's just this building back here. It's a very simple building, but its, intent, uh, its purpose is to house a practice area for, uh, for our marching band. Uh, they currently use some space in, inside uh, Goodwin Hall, but they're really crammed in there. Uh, so one of their requests was to do this additional building. A nice part of it, about it is we are creating some additional plaza space uh, in front of uh, the building there. This is just across the street. This is Sanford Avenue here and just across the street from the Hill Resident Hall complex. 
With some of this development, especially with uh, brown copple, we are facing some challenges here because this was a parking area and it was used as a service area to not just by uh, facilities management services, it was also used by the folks uh, in Dudley Hall and the architecture students for bringing supplies back and forth. So we are adding these things to campus. We, we are taking away some, some parking, but it's part of the process of rethinking how we, uh, how we do uh, parking on, on campus. Um, the idea was that they're take, these students are taking a lot of their classes here, uh, and so they wanted to have a rehearsal area that was close to the place where they're taking a lot of their classes. The band field, uh, I don't know the band practice schedule, how they do it during the off season. I know it's mostly used during football season and during the summer. Uh, I anticipate this being used a lot for practice. It also allows this space to be used by other uh, uh, other students in in the, the school of music and also in the uh, uh, in the College of Liberal Arts. So, uh, a couple other projects uh, going on. We're relocating the poultry farm from the research park to up to North Auburn. This is a project that started in 2018. Uh, it, it continues. It'll be completed uh, by um, uh, by next year, probably by the summer of next year. We've already built an administration building. Uh, there's uh, multi, multiple phases to it. We've, we've added some of these uh, research function buildings. One of these two buildings, I believe it's this one, is going to be uh, a new uh, processing plant. Now this is all done for poultry research. Uh, they have strong ties to the poultry industry and uh, this, is, um, this gives Auburn a leg up as far as advancing that industry, advancing food, uh, food uh, service industry, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, advancing our, our research capabilities for that. This is, wasn't something that needed to belong in Research Park. It had just been there for a long time. North Auburn was the place for it. This also frees up some land in Research Park for future, uh, uh, future research facilities. This is uh, off of um, yeah it, it's uh, I'm, I'm I'm drawing a blank now of what the north yeah it's uh, it, it's it's off of it's off of near Farmdale Road um, I forget what there it's you know when you take a left I think onto Farmdale off of South College I forget what the road is that goes north. It'll take you all the way to 280, but it's. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. It's kind of tucked away back in there. So. Okay, upcoming projects. Uh, these are the projects that we're looking at to help us um, kind of continue the plan for either replacement or developing new facilities. The first five projects on there have all received final Board of Trustees ap approval and are the ones I'm just going to talk about briefly uh, in, in the upcoming slides. So the five projects are the Academic Classroom and Laboratory Complex. This is the new uh, classroom building that's going to go in there and replace, uh, that's going to be located in the area next to Parker and Allison. Uh, there's also going to be a new central dining facility that, that's located there. Uh, an advanced structural testing lab, the Rain Culinary Science Center, and some additional uh, campus utility work that's causing <laughs> and will cause some disruptions uh, right in the, kind of near the downtown area across from Sanford Park for the, uh, for the next year or so. Uh, we're also doing some additional campus parking expansion. Uh, we're adding some, uh, some campus parking lots in, in, in the Hayfield and also we're expanding the West Campus parking lots. Uh, this is mostly to uh, give us additional room uh, for some housing development we, we're looking at doing in, in the near future. Uh, both Plainsman Park for baseball and, and the Jane B. Moore uh, softball complex are going to have player development. Uh, areas that will be uh, under construction beginning shortly. Uh, and in design, I don't have slides on these, uh, but they're just currently in design. There's not much to show now. 
The big one here is a new College of Education building, and the big reason that's an important one for us is because College of Education is one of the, uh, one of the three primary occupants of Haley Center. This is a big step towards getting them out of Haley Center uh, and, 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 uh, and consolidating uh, the functions of the college, and this will allow us to um, either do some renovations to Haley Center or take the next step and, and look to, to tear down uh, Haley Center at some point in time. Again, the other big uh, functions are uh, our College of Liberal Arts has a lot of offices and the provost classroom, which the academic classroom and laboratory complex uh, helps pr provide some relief for. So one of the first steps we needed to work on Haley is to get this College of Education. So this was approved to move forward by the, by the board. We're doing the design. Uh, it will need to go back to the board for a final approval. We anticipate that beginning in construction sometime in 2020. Uh, we're, yes. Uh, the location uh, right now we feel is best and is likely going to go is on P.O. Davis Drive, just south of uh, the Hill dormitories and, and next to uh, the Poultry Science Center. There's an open, open area there uh, that we think would work, work well for them. Uh, chilled water system expansion, we're nearing our capacity for, for providing chilled water to the campus. So uh, what a new plant will allow us to do, we're going to reach that capacity with all of our new development right around 2021. So we're looking to build a new plant somewhere on the south side of campus to uh, probably along Lem Morrison, uh, not far uh, from the medical clinic in that area there. Uh, we're looking at different sites now. We have not selected a final site for that, um, but this is something we, uh, we need to do. It's, you know, our, our utilities and providing utilities from campus, it's, it's not the flashiest stuff, but it's essential for our operations. So uh, we'll be looking at that. Also, Research Park. I didn't get much talk much about Research Park in this uh, presentation. We have a hand in what goes on in Research Park, but a lot of what happens in Research Park happens independently. Um, but they are building some new, uh, uh, new buildings, two new buildings there. One is going to be in East Alabama Medical Center. It's going to be a bedless hospital. Uh, and then a, no, I'm sorry, it's not the bedless hospital. It's going to be an ambulatory surgery center. So there will be a freestanding emergency room. There will be uh, uh, they will have surgery facilities there, mostly for outpatient. There will be a third floor there, which will be for, uh, for future clinics uh, and, uh, and other supplemental uh, uh, groups that, that belong to the hospital. That is going to be uh, constructed along Sugar Jordan Drive uh, on the west side of, of, of the research park. I don't think I have a... Um, oh, I can go back to a map. Uh, in a little bit and show you where that might be. Uh, just to talk about these projects, these are what you're going to see coming up. This is the new uh, classroom and laboratory uh, complex. So it's a big building. We're building a lot of classroom space. We really need to continue the modernization of our classroom space. This area right here, this is where Parker Hall is. So during construction, Parker Hall will remain standing. It will, be, uh, it will be torn down uh, upon completion so we can, we can uh, construct this new green space uh, that will open up to, uh, to the north of campus and to the campus green next to the, to the stadium. Uh, it's going to have capacity seating for 2,000 students in various uh, classrooms. I believe there's going to be about 26 fe uh, flexible classrooms and five large lecture halls. Also, the Big EO Center is going to be uh, relocated there. As I mentioned, it's a big building, 150,000 square feet, uh, and the budget we have now is about 83 million. Uh, it's, oops, here's the building from a, a different view. This is from uh, facing, uh, essentially from the uh, looking northwest, uh, kind of from the, uh, the Gorey Center here. You can see the uh, part of Dudley uh, Hall right here. One of, the, uh, one of the things we're introducing with that is currently Graves Drive runs along here. We are going to be closing down Graves Drive, and we're going to be making that a pedestrian walkway uh, with the intention of 
making this a pedestrian thoroughfare to take us to parts to the west and, and, and south of campus. Uh, Graves Amphitheater will remain here, uh, and so this, this walkway is going to be very close to, uh, to Graves Amphitheater uh, right here. It's, as I said, it's, it's, a very, it's a tall, long building. We've, we've gone through a lot of variations on what this should look like to try to keep it at an Auburn building. We think we got pretty close, uh, but it's, it's, been a, it's been a challenging one. You can see the building right here. It's about the same length as Parker Hall and Allison combined. Allison needs to come down because we're also building a central dining facility there. Uh, we ex Allison is going to be torn down beginning next month. We expect to begin construction on ACLC uh, in the next two months, preferably, hopefully by June. You'll probably see construction fence, uh, fencing going up at the end of May. Uh, this building will be open for the fall um, 2021 semester for, uh, for full use. The central dining facility is the building that's going in right next to it. Uh, this is going to be a 48,000 square foot building. It's going to be an 800 seat dining hall, plus some additional what we call retail uh, dining areas. Um, uh, it, they'll be in the basement. The, uh, the seating area will be mostly uh, on, on top. This is actually a return to kind of a more traditional cafeteria style dining hall. Uh, where you'll be able to go to different stations as part of your meal plan. You just go in there, you take your tray, you get what you want, you find your seat, that's it. It's not purchasing something from Chick-fil-A or, or, or Papa John's Pizza or anything like that. This is going to be a, a more traditional university uh, dining hall. You can see a good view of this campus green space here, which is something that we, we hope will be a, a, a big added benefit uh, to the university. There are some topography challenges which we're still working through here, um, but this is going to be a tiered uh, green space area. Part of the benefit of this also is for football. It will add some additional tailgate space to the area, but it, we anticipate it being used year-round uh, uh, by, by students. Another view of the campus of the dining area. This dining area will open before the, the central classroom facility. This is going to open in fall of 2020. So construction on that will begin uh, very soon. And you can see the, uh, that dining facility here. You can see that's the reason we need to tear down Allison first because uh, it essentially goes in the area where the, uh, uh, where the dining facility will go. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, they can. I believe that all students are required to pick one level of, uh, of their dining plan. There's a basic, a lot of our students, we only have about 20% of our students living on campus. So a lot of our on-campus sales are for students who are here during lunchtime. But students will often go elsewhere and have their dinners closer to where they live. And since 80% live off campus, they're often going someplace near their home or, or they're making something uh, at, 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 their, uh, at their apartment uh, or such. Um, the current plan, it's um, there, they are allotted a certain amount of money and they go to these different either retail areas around campus and they essentially pay the price that's listed on, on the uh, uh, and they receive a debit card. They swipe their debit card and they, it's like a retail purchase in essence. This will be a little bit different. I don't know if they've completely worked out, but this will be more traditional where it's essentially an, an all you can or all you wish you, to eat for a certain price for the entire semester. So that's, that's my understanding of how this is going to work. Uh, I don't think they've worked out all the details of it yet, but uh, we went up uh, to Clemson and visited a, a similar type of uh, uh, of plan that they had there. It, it, it's common in a lot of areas, but it's, it's going away from the retail type of, uh, of dining experience that we have on campus. Uh, this is the Advanced Structural Testing Laboratory. Uh, this one is going, um, will be built, this will be on West Samford Avenue, close to the Shug Jordan intersection. This is a different looking building for Auburn. There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a single piece of brick on the building. Um, we, uh, the University Architect's Office thought about this and uh, we looked at different variations of this about putting brick on this large structure. 
This building is going to be uh, used for testing civil engineering construction materials, namely large I-beams, large uh, concrete beams. Uh, for beams up to 135 feet long. They will bring them in there and they'll uh, do testing on it. Um, and so because this is so far kind of on the edge of campus, far from the core, um, from an appearance standpoint, we felt that just putting brick on this building would be forcing something that just didn't really belong on, on the building. It does look like that's that's a really good point. It's very much like an like an airport type building. Uh, facilities management is also located here. We don't have a lot of brick buildings here, so I don't think we'd want to do too many other buildings like this on campus. But we um, for this one with this design because it's such a unique use, um, we we did step away from our traditional image and character. Uh, but we felt like we came up with a, 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 a good design for this building. Uh, it's a $22 million building. Uh, as I mentioned, it's for steel and concrete testing. You can see this is the view from Sanford Avenue. Um, you may know this is the uh, current community garden and facilities management is located just across the road, uh, road here. Uh, a rendering of what the in, inside of the building here. We had this heavy bay for bringing in large uh, uh, structural beams. And uh, underneath this floor, there's be, there'll be lots of testing equipment, testing the different, uh, uh, the structural capacity of, of different engineering materials. So, uh, and you can see where it's located right here, uh, right on West Samford Avenue, right on Shug Jordan Parkway. Again, it's, it's a little bit far away from the, uh, from the core of campus here. No, no. What they're going to be doing, you can probably see the truck here. They're going to be hauling these in. Now they won't be hauling 135 be foot beams in very often. I was told maybe once or twice a year. But when they do it, they have to stop all traffic in the area. They have to get a police escort. And it was challenging developing this bed because the way the truck has to come in, it has to come in here and then back into this area. So it's really disruptive to any traffic here on West Sanford Avenue. But it, they wanted to have the, the capacity to do that. Exactly. This this will open up. You'll you'll uh, take the beam in there, and then there will be a, uh, you know, a a door coming down on there, closing it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the final uh, building I'm going to talk about here is also one of the ones that's kind of pushing the envelope of things. Uh, this is the uh, Tony and Liberain Culinary Science Center. Uh, this is the building is going on. Uh, it will be constructed um, uh, on the, at the intersection of Thatch Avenue and South College Street, almost catty corner to, uh, to Sanford Hall. So this, is a, uh, this building will house multiple functions. Uh, one of the function is uh, culinary science classroom and demonstration spaces. So there will be it, it's, it's meant to teach the arts of, uh, you know, of culinary science. So it will have uh, classrooms there. It will have food testing labs. It will have beverage testing labs in it. Uh, it's also meant to be a teaching area. It will have a teaching restaurant in it. Most of that will be located on the bottom three floors of the building. The top three floors are going to house two things. One, it's going to house a new hotel. Uh, this is what they're calling a teaching hotel. It's going to be about a 26-room hotel. It's going to be a five-diamond hotel, which is the highest ranking that you can have on. It's intended to teach students to work in those types, types of hotels. Um, the, the top level will have uh, all the amenities that a five-diamond hotel will have, uh, spa spaces and such, everything. It will be pretty expensive to get a room in this hotel. It's not something that's that's typical for Auburn. I don't know if it's something that Auburn really needs, but there has been a big push to do this, and our our office was asked to design it, so or help design it, I should say. There will also be six leased living units 
uh, on here. Uh, these are units that will wear the cost of these units. They, whomever is going to lease them will be asked to provide the money up front and they will have 75, 50 to 75 year leases on, on the buildings. There'll be six of them in the buildings. Part of the cost of the upfront cost will go towards the construction of the building. Um, it's going to be, no, it's long. It's going to be 50 to 75. I, I, I don't know, I don't recall the exact length of the leases there, but it's, uh, uh, the cost will be $2 million each upfront. Um, there's a couple other uh, amenities. The challenge with this building, at least for me, is that it's not really meant for your average Auburn University employee, student, resident. It's designed for a higher end. Now, you, all, all, everyone will be able to teach, take least, uh, teaching or take classes, culinary classes in the building. That will be open to the public. Beverage appreciation courses will be open to the public. Um, but the rest of it is really geared towards a higher end clientele. You say you have a restaurant at all. There will be a restaurant on the ground floor uh, in, in the front. Uh, They are going to park in the new, new deck. That's that's what the, that's one of the reasons the new deck was uh, was intended. So because there will be hotel parking, and by hotel parking, it's not just for the AU hotel; it's also for this hotel here. Uh, but they are um, most of the activities I, I believe will be take place in the evening when our parking does open up in, in the evening for uses there. Uh, I've heard mixed things on that. I don't know the right answer to that. Uh, it will, the idea of the restaurant is that it will, they will bring in some kind of celebrity chefs who will also help teach students there. I don't know if it's geared towards the folks in the hotel uh, or if it's going to be open to the public. I imagine it has to be open to the public because I don't know how much occupancy the hotel will have on your average weekend. Um, uh, that's what I'm, thank you. <laughs> Adjacent to the building, there will be two amenities that are for kind of your, your Auburn residents, and they're good ones. They're, this one is going to be a food court, um, and so where it'll be open to the public, you go inside, there, I don't have a plan of it right now, but there'll be various stations, kind of like the new food hall, but these are various retail stations. You can pick the type of food you want, get it, and sit very much kind of like a mall food court, but a little bit, I think a little bit nicer uh, than that. In between the two is going to be space for a, uh, a brew pub also, um, which will also will be open, open to the public. They anticipate having one of the major uh, independent brewers come in and, and, and operate the facility there. Nothing, no one's been selected yet, but that's the, uh, that's the goal. It will have an open space here, which will hold events uh, year round. Um, this is an entrance. The entrance to the hotel will be around the back of the building. <laughs> so you'll have to enter it along Thatch Avenue here, pull inside, and you'll get, you know, five diamond service for, uh, for using the uh, hotel. Here's, an, here's a view from above of what the, uh, the Rain Culinary Center will be like. This isn't the type of project that's my favorite project. I, you know, I, I, like I said, it's important for me and for us to do uh, projects that enhance the mission of the university, but uh, there has been some demand for this, and uh, our our office has has assisted in, in the planning, and uh, our architects have helped uh, manage the uh, the development of the of the project. So, it, it's got some good amenities that that could be beneficial to the uh, to the university, so uh, or to and to the community at large. The, yes. Mm -hmm. It seems like you can't get to it anymore, so why can't we use that for something? Much of that, yeah, much of the, uh, um, let's see, the married student housing has been replaced by, uh, by parking area. That's the West Campus parking lots. Uh, there are, there is some, there's one building left. 
Uh, and there is one area to the north of it that where the buildings were just torn down, but the areas, we've been using that mostly for construction prep and lay down area. Uh, the other areas, there's really not much of it left, and what, what, ha what is left has been covered up by, with parking. So you can still access and drive to that area. It's mostly student parking back there also, so you don't get a lot of uh, you know, regular university staff or faculty or visitors uh, parking out there. So. We are looking at that right. It seems like you, need both door and park. you are absolutely right. We are looking at that right now. Um, we actually came up with some plans to build some new housing there and to build some parking there, uh, but we still haven't gotten approval on it. So we've we're we're looking at other options too. But Where did I, you say I missed it? at the CDV extension uh, area, which is let me. Pull up a map here. This area here, you remember the CDV extension? It was the buildings. Which, this is right on Wire Road here. These have been torn down, and right now the area is just used for parking. Um, so I agree. I think that would be a good area for, for new housing. Yeah. Other than, um, oops, uh, where are we? We are right here. The building itself, uh, I think, will improve the appearance of it, but I don't think there's going to be any renovations to, at this time, bleachers. to the bleachers or anything right now. Yep. Okay, and then you also uh, you talked about the parking deck at the hotel was going to be for hotel pickup customers. Yes. So Yes, it will, I believe it will be available to them too, not just for guests. Um, that's a good question. Uh, we'll have to. I know that I've gone to several sure. conferences there during the daytime. Yep. Um, I, I imagine one, if you have a, 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 an A or B pass on campus, you can just park in the A and B parking. But if you're not affiliated with the university at this time, uh, I, I haven't heard the plan for that, but that's a good question. I'll check with the uh, the director of parking on that. Yes. So, but I, so there's a big, large area. Yeah. What yeah. are the chances of doing something for the kids within, say, the next 10 years? I know you've got to get the people out of there. Uh, yes. And that's been the challenge is that we were, after we built the arena, we were about ready to tear the Coliseum down. And I kind of regret that we didn't. It became, it got backfilled. <laughs> uh, Athletics still has offices in there. One of the big uses of it now is that there's a lot of space underneath the stands. And one of the big uses that is, is one of the departments of COSAM Geosciences, that's actually their home now. So we're looking, one of the big replacements we would like to do is replace Funches Hall. Uh, we would like to replace Funches Hall, build a new COSAM building, and move those occupants plus the occupants of Beard Eves Geosciences to that building. We can't do anything with it until we have a place for them to go. But athletics, from what I'm told, would be pretty easy to get them out of the building. Uh, we just have to get Geosciences out of there. So once we do that, oh boy, um, we've been told that replacing Funchess is a priority. I hate putting a date on things because it always comes back to bite us <laughs> in the rear end, <laughs> um, frankly. So um, if, if Funchess, the replacement of Funchess becomes a priority, I think about five years from now, I think you can see a strong movement to get, to get everybody out of there. That's, that's just my personal opinion. Yes. Yeah, the, the stadium, the stadium parking deck, uh, or campus green deck, which is right here, just to the south. You uh, you would access that either via Duncan Drive, or you can come along Donahue Drive. That's where we have the designated visitor parking. 
uh, on campus. I, it's not the most convenient location. Um, and this is another challenge that our, our office is working on. I think the total visitor experience to Auburn is not a very good one. Um, so we recognize that. That's something we need to improve. We need to, for, especially for parents and students visiting university for the first time, we need to make this as enjoyable as enjoyable an experience as possible by providing easy parking, by providing a direct easy place to go. Right now they have to go to the quad center, which is, you know, it's tough to, you have to park here in the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, stadium deck and then walk over to the quad center here. Um, so we're looking at doing some development possibly here possibly replacing the library deck. It's something we're considering. We don't have plans to do it yet, but we're looking at, at different, different options there now. So. But. Yeah, but a visitor center, enrollment, and a bookstore, we kind of think all should be in very close proximity to each other. Yes, sir. It depends on the project. Um, th you're talking about the future projects or the ones that are just being nearing completion now? Here's the challenge is that um, we have a l whole list of projects of things that need to be built. Um, what trumps everything is when we get a big gift. So for the Gavin Center, which is the renovation of textile, money came in on that. For the Brown Koppel Student Engineering Achievement Center, money came in for that. For the, um, for the Performing Arts Center. These are projects that come in and take up our capacity to do projects. They're good projects, but they're gift driven, which means the university doesn't have to match funding as much as they do for other projects. Um, it, it depends on who the, who's requesting the projects. A lot of them the university is borrowing money for to be paid back from, from, uh, with tuition revenue in the future because borrowing costs are still very low now. Uh, we're taking advantage of that and, uh, and we'll use, especially for our academic buildings, we'll use tuition to, to pay for, for that in the future. Uh, uh, ac uh, athletics buildings are played, paid for through, uh, uh, through athletics funding. They, they kind of operate on, on a separate budget. Um, the classroom building, that's being paid for uh, by the university. That's, that's university general funds and general fund borrowing. Uh, the structural testing lab, that one we got a lot of money from the state on. That was, uh, because we got contributions from the state on that, we acted on that and we're, we're moving forward on that. Rain Center is one big mix of funding that keeps changing. Some of that is coming from the revenue from those leased living units. Other money is coming from, uh, from the university. Uh, other money is coming from anticipated revenue from the hotel, uh, which pro the university probably has to front uh, at the beginning. But they've worked out a pro forma for that. It's a little bit crazy on that one. I don't, I don't know all the details on it, so it's, it's tricky. If it's academic, it's generally going to be paid for by university general funds and tuition revenue. Anything else is going to have probably a different revenue source on that. Uh, student housing, when we build housing, will come from student housing revenue. So. Any other questions? Was that helpful? I hope. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Uh, that one I refuse to give a timeline on. Um, and it's not because it's not important. It's, it's because emptying folks out of Taley Center has been complicated. So we've got the College of Education going. Next step is trying to is find space for liberal arts offices there. Um, we have some ideas of, of what to do with that, um, but we probably won't be able to address that for a while. In the meantime, we're patching Haley Center to try to keep it going for as long as we can. I anticipate Beard Eves coming down before Haley. I don't know if Haley's going to come down for another 10 years, frankly. Um, but I hope it does. That, that's a challenge, is that, as with, and with asbestos, if, as long as it's not disturbed, 
like a lot of older buildings, generally you're okay. If things decay, you know, it, it has to be checked, uh, obviously. Um, but yes, that's, that's the biggest problem. Normally with a building, we could do, for a large building, we can do sections at a time. With Haley, there is the as asbestos issue. We start tearing apart walls and, and ceilings and floors. You really have to take every precaution, precaution needed to prevent any asbestos dust or whatever to, uh, from, from spreading to any other part of the building. So uh, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, I don't know if a renovation of Haley is really possible. Um, so. Um, Yeah, no, we've heard of a number of, 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 I shouldn't say a number of folks, we've heard of folks sneaking on uh, Jordan Hare Stadium to, to, to spread ashes at, at, you know, they're sneak in there and that's been done. But, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying there's a strong connection of alumni, you know, you know, and folks tied to the university to do, to have their remains arrest at, at, on campus. No, we have not been approached about that. We have been asked uh, about if the university is doing anything to provide senior housing for the future for folks who want to come back to Auburn, retire in Auburn. Um, that's not something we've, we, we've really taken on. Um, and so we have not been asked that question. I, I don't think that's something that, that the university would provide funds for, frankly. So. Yeah. <laughs> but you can tend to buy those things ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And it can be almost anywhere. Yeah, it's <laughs> true. Not true. All our big green spots sitting like it's along there. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if the question comes up at some time in in, in the future, near future. So, yeah. Okay. Now, I've I've spoken enough. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, okay.